Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Big Brain Time. The Great Barrington Declaration is something you should be concerned about. The Great Barrington Declaration is basically a compilation of the reasons why to reopen the country. It was written by medical professors from reputable schools like Stanford, Harvard, and Oxford universities. That's what makes this even more interesting. Be sure to stick around until the end of the video to find out what exactly all this is about. Let's get started. So yeah, the Great Barrington Declaration is basically a document that's written by three authors from different universities, Stanford, Harvard, and Oxford. And basically, it's a not so detailed plan that advocates to reopen the country because childhood vaccination rates have gone down, worsening cardiovascular disease outcomes have gone up, fewer cancer screenings are happening, deteriorating child and adult mental health is getting worse, suicide rates are on the rise, domestic violence is up, depression and anxiety disorders are growing, more and more people are going into poverty, food insecurity and hunger are on the rise, homelessness and shelter insecurity are high, substance abuse is up, dementia sufferers face worsening anxiety confusion, and these issues are having a far worse impact on the minority communities than the rich communities that are profiting off of this pandemic. Yeah, I don't know about you, but just thinking about this sends me into a hellhole of despair. In fact, the only thing that would probably be worse would be meeting and shaking hands with Turtle Face over here, in which case I'd probably cry a lot, and I'd probably sound like Luigi getting hit by a turtle shell. Oh, it's -a me, a Luigi! Oh, a turtle shell! Wah! But even with all these problems, is it right to completely reopen the country? We here at Big Brain Time have compiled a list of reasons of why not to. We're gonna go through the Great Barrington Declaration, paragraph by paragraph, to review these rebuttals. We also have the obligation of letting you know that we're not professors, we're not experts of any kind. We don't work at the CDC. We actually consider ourselves broke undergrads that are voluntarily participating in this extracurricular that has become Kind of into a class. Yeah. The point is, we're not experts, so please take our research and what we say with a grain of salt. If you want to see the sources we used for this video, they're all linked in the description. Spoiler alert, there's a lot down there. Okay, let's finally get started. Here's how this will work. Over here, we're going to put up the actual text of the Great Barrington Declaration, but I'm just going to summarize these paragraphs as we go along. And then I'm going to rebut them. The first three paragraphs of the declaration talk about the risks involved with continuing the lockdown. Now, those are the ones we mentioned earlier, however, the declaration just mentions a few of them. Now, that itself isn't a critique, I'm just letting you know. The declaration goes on to say that the only way to solve these problems is by reopening the country. So while the problems they state here are true and valid, there are other ways of resolving or combating them instead of just reopening the entire country, which will eventually turn into a partisan issue and will potentially lead to the unnecessary deaths of 1,385,800 people. And that's according to a generous CDC estimate. The fourth paragraph of the declaration talks about the COVID-19 virus being more deadly in the elderly and vulnerable populations than in the young populations. Sure, yeah, that's also true, but here's an important caveat. Even those who are less vulnerable to the virus can still die or suffer the after effects, which can in turn ruin quality of life. For example, many COVID patients that did recover still had severe long-term damage to their lungs, heart, brain, and other organs throughout their entire body. Some of these damages are permanent. They cannot be fixed. Kind of in the same way that telling your girlfriend that you're not cheating on her, but you're just mingling around will end up with her permanently dumping your ass. The fifth and sixth paragraphs talk about herd immunity, in that we should be balancing the risks and benefits of herd immunity and allowing those that are at minimal risk of death to live their lives normally. According to the authors, this would allow them to build up immunity to the virus through natural infection, and the protection would be focused on those who are at a higher risk of dying from COVID, such as the elderly and vulnerable populations. They also go on to talk about what sort of activities should reopen. Basically everything that doesn't involve older and vulnerable people. Okay, now that we're done with that, let's talk about why these paragraphs are whack AF. Because there's a lot of reasons. One, herd immunity is basically the concept of a certain number of people building immunity to the virus to the point where they can't give or get the virus to or from the other people in the community. Now there's two main ways of going about gaining herd immunity in a population. One, through natural infection, which is like coughing on someone's face. <laughs> or crowd surfing in a pandemic.
And natural infection is the method that these authors of the Great Barrington Declaration are proposing that we deal with. Yeah, I don't know about that. <coughs> the second way is through vaccines. You know, that highly dependable thing that people are becoming really frustrated over. For any infectious disease in the past, we have never, and I repeat, we have never depended upon natural infection to get rid of that disease. Smallpox, we eradicated it and we use vaccines. Polio, we are currently in the middle of eradicating it and we're also using vaccines. We've always developed vaccines and minimized the extra death count in that way. Let me say this again. If we completely reopen the country, using generous CDC death rates of around 0.65%, that's less than 1%. It is estimated that we would have an additional 1,385,800 deaths on top of the 200,000 some deaths we have right now. I'm not talking about cases here, folks. I'm talking about actual people dying. And here's the thing, you don't need an ethics class to tell you that that's just the wrong thing to do. Also remember, young people that are going around and about can still get COVID and end up with dangerous after effects. And the cherry on top of this disaster Sunday is that we don't know a lot about COVID in general. There's no way we can learn about an entire virus in less than a year. So making the assumption that herd immunity will even work for this virus is a big uncertainty. For other viruses, herd immunity works. You get the disease, you get over it. Next time you get it, you don't actually get it because you're immune. You don't show any symptoms. But with COVID, reinfections have occurred sometimes with more devastating effects than the first infection in certain individuals. For example, in Nevada and Ecuador, there were case studies conducted where two individuals had worse symptoms and were hospitalized after getting reinfected with the virus. Now, as for reopening the country, Schools and universities reopening without social distancing is a terrible idea. Our professors are boomers, they're gonna get sick and die. We don't want that to happen. So I reluctantly welcome Zoom University because it's kind of to save people from dying. The GBD advocates for sports to be resumed in full force. Most sports are close contact. Cases would go up like, uh, I don't know, these guys? Ever heard of that happening? Akash, 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 Akash. I know you're mad, relax. Okay, fine. If not schools and sports, why don't we reopen concerts and theaters? Yeah, people need a good time to relax and everything. Are you dumb? Are you, are you, are you dumb? So instead of six feet apart, you're gonna be six centimeters apart from a person? You're gonna co get COVID that way? Hey, this is, you see what I have to deal with? That's how. Yeah, so bottom line, I don't think opening concerts and theaters would be a good idea because you're basically sitting six centimeters away from a person instead of six feet. Also, I was really not hoping to get COVID from that guy coughing up his popcorn whenever Adam Sandler makes another stupid accent. I'm not even gonna do an act out of that because that's so bad. By that. Okay, anyway, the declaration wraps up with this conclusion and I'm gonna read it word for word so you can figure out exactly what's going on here and exactly how BS it is. People who are more at risk may participate in society if they wish, while society as a whole enjoys the protection conferred upon the vulnerable by those who have built up herd immunity. People who are more at risk may participate if they wish. Okay, I really hope I'm reading this wrong because I definitely need more clarification. What in the world do these medical professors even mean by that? Because it seems like they're suggesting that people who are at risk should go outside if they want. So they not only would put themselves in danger, but they risk the chance of getting others infected if they themselves get infected. Seems like kind of a douchey thing for a bunch of doctors to recommend. Also, what's up with that second part? Society as a whole enjoys protection conferred upon the vulnerable by those who have built up herd immunity? So basically, let's celebrate and dance on the 1 million deaths that happened because of natural infection induced herd immunity that couldn't get proper care because they lacked the resources? Yeah, no thank you. And all those problems aside, this was the worst conclusion sentence for any declaration ever. This is like if the Declaration of Independence ended with, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yeah, tell that Georgie boy that we shoved his tea in the water. We don't care for it at all. What? You scared? You scared? Come fight us, Georgie. You scared? Sorry, that's my best John Oliver impression. And now, on to a better conclusion. We feel that this declaration was written in haste, with little consideration of the consequences that might happen. Kind of like old Rudy's interactions with this interviewer right here. 
to the try. Belgian. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> you can give me your phone number and your address. Okay, faults aside, the declaration in general does bring up a very good question, which is how much damage is this lockdown causing to our society? And what can we possibly do besides reopening the country to solve these problems? To reiterate, these problems are lower childhood vaccination rates, less cancer screenings, deteriorating mental health, and an increased racial minority wealth and wellness gap, among many others. But the way we get over them is by attacking them one by one. Not in one fell swoop of reopening the country and risking millions of lives. Currently, psychiatrists and psychologists are already working on the deteriorating mental health aspect of it by opening up more accessible, affordable, and convenient telemedicine sites and online clinics. If you need access to resources like that, a link to this is provided in the description below. It's separate from all the sources, so you'll actually be able to find it. Hospitals are working to increase their safety and social distancing protocols when doing cancer screenings, administering vaccines, and treating patients. In fact, hospitals might be one of the more safer places because of all the guidelines they're taking. There has also been a sharp increase in pro bono work in minority communities. Pro bono work is basically volunteerism. Now, obviously, we're still feeling the impact, so what's going on is not enough. There is definitely more that needs to be done to make sure that people feel safe coming into hospitals and clinics and making sure that minority groups are not experiencing the absolute worst of this pandemic. Progress isn't gonna be easy. Nobody ever said it was. And it's going to take multiple steps. But if we can attack these problems one by one and mitigate the risk of killing millions of people in a bipartisan way, then we should all be for it and we should work to make it happen. If you have a large social media following, we'd recommend choosing a problem and advocating for that one problem. Use your social media to incite change in a specific avenue. That way more of your attention is focused towards it and you can actually focus on making change. We hope we've given you some resources to do better in your communities and we hope you take this video seriously. I mean, Hopefully you laughed at the jokes, but like, you know what I mean. Thank you for watching. This has been Big Brain Time. Thank you everyone for watching this latest episode of Big Brain Time. I'll keep this pretty short. To subscribe, click right down here. To watch any of our previous videos, click right up here. Go ahead, leave a like on this video if you liked any part of it, and we will see you in the next episode.